Hello, you're watching Policy Beats with me, Hamza Rifa. Today we're going to be speaking about Pakistan's foreign policy challenges and opportunities. We're going to be going into retrospect because 2021 is upon us. And in 2020, we've seen major events taking place, both regionally and internationally, which have had an impact on Pakistan. Now, with the current government uh, pushing uh, itself forward, uh, with the belligerent India right next door, and the fact that Iran's challenges are also there as well, we need to look forward to the prospect of ensuring that our foreign policy is pretty much aligned with regional and global dynamics as well. I have with me Ambassador Rifat Masood, who served in Tehran as well as in Norway as well. Ambassador Rifat Masood, thank you so much for joining me on Policy Beats. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. We have the Afghan peace process taking place and we also have the Iranian dynamics and the Middle Eastern dynamics with the JCPOA deal, which was scrapped by the Donald Trump administration. And there is this optimism that the Biden administration might resuscitate the JCPOA deal. First of all, as a veteran diplomat that you were, tell me briefly about what Pakistan's foreign policy challenges have been regionally. You know, we are placed, Pakistan has the opportunity and also the challenge of being in a region uh, which has been uh, undergoing a lot of turmoil in the past few decades. And uh, we have managed, I think, to maneuver ourselves quite well. And I say this because we are uh, surrounded by uh, countries uh, who, with whom we have uh, either hostile relations or uh, difficult relations. And, um, but given that environment that we live in, uh, the governments uh, of the past and even the present government have tried you know, their best to uh, maneuver in such a way that uh, we manage to keep our interests um, intact and also uh, ensure that uh, there is no regional disturbance which can um, be detrimental. Of course, we have suffered. I mean, we have uh, the war in Afghanistan has uh, taken a heavy toll on us. And that's why I think the Afghan peace process is uh, paramount for the Afghan and the Afghanis, Afghan government and Afghanis, but more also for us, because the more peace and stability there is in Afghanistan, we would have that sort of peace and stability in Pakistan. Uh, with Iran, I, I personally feel that, you see, we, have, we need to um, focus a little more, because, uh, as I said earlier, we are in a, uh, in a region where we are surrounded by countries with, with whom we've had difficult relations. Now, Iran is a country which, uh, with which we don't really have any problems, per se, you know? Right. We don't have a territorial dispute with Iran. We don't have any uh, ideological problems with Iran. We are both Muslim countries. We share common uh, borders, religion, culture, even language. Um, Pakistanis are well respected and liked in Iran. I mean, at the, at the, the time that I spent there, when I would uh, meet the local Iranian people, they would be thrilled that they were meeting a Pakistani. And, um, but somehow, I think uh, the regional dynamics and politics uh, in the region have somehow made us, um, I wouldn't say ignore, but at least not engage with Iran the way we should have. Is it because of the ongoing Iranian-Saudi rivalry which has characterized the Middle East throughout 2020 and Pakistan's, you could say, more uh, Pakistan's proclivity towards Riyadh at the expense of Tehran? Well, I don't think you can really refer to Iranian-Saudi rivalry as ongoing. This is a historical rivalry. It's spanned many, many years, decades. In fact, uh, by some, if you read some historians, and if you follow Iranian uh, history from the time of the Persian times, they, they've always had a, a rivalry with the, with the Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia yes. um, that's a historical thing. So, but uh, because there's always been this uh, Arab versus Ajam 
concept and you can see it it's more pronounced now but it's it's been there for a long time now I would say yes and no because of course Saudi Arabia is a very important country for Pakistan it's a, a very strong ally we have uh, excellent relations and we need to maintain those relations of course um, but that does not mean you know the world is no longer zero sum you know it doesn't mean that just because we have very strong and historical and friendly ties with Saudi Arabia of course we have so many Pakistanis working there and um, uh, we have religious uh, sentiments attached to Saudi Arabia it doesn't mean that we should ignore another country and especially a country which is our neighbor Ambassador Riffith, you spoke about regional maneuverability. Mm -hmm. Now we have a belligerent India right next door yeah. and with the Hindutva ideology, the RSS mm -hmm. ideology being mm -hmm. more pronounced and we're mm -hmm. talking about a Modi which believes in an expansionist India mm -hmm. which has sought to isolate Pakistan in international forums. Mm -hmm. We also have the Disinfo Lab which clearly shows the underhand tactics mm -hmm. that have been used. You mentioned how we've managed to maneuver very delicately between the Saudi-Iranian uh, relationship. The challenge that India poses to us is significant. Uh, do you see any breakthrough between Indo-Pak relations, uh, within Indo-Pak relations uh, for the upcoming future? Or do you think that this trend is going to continue? A quick answer to your question is no. Because India, um, uh, Modi's government right now has been more open and it's 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 stated what was the obvious to people like me diplomats like me even people like me who visited india lived in india uh, it was obvious that india pakistan relations for them to be uh, normal i'm not talking about good but even normal mm. would take maybe a generation or more because of the, the mindset that exists in India. And India being the larger country, of course, its mindset is, uh, has, is more pronounced and has a bigger impact. And throughout, if you look at, at, at our history, throughout Pakistan has always been very steadfast in saying that we want to have good, normal, neighborly relations with India. We want to have a civil relationship with India. We don't want to continue like this. And um, unfortunately uh, for this region, and I would say unfortunately for India uh, mainly, uh, and for the world, because the world has not understood it, uh, India took our goodwill as a sign of weakness, always. And they would become, whenever we would extend a hand of friendship or give a sign that we were willing to sort of talk about outstanding issues, India immediately would think, ah, Pakistan is, you know, now in our grip and we will, and then they would become more belligerent, which was not right because Pakistan, I feel, and having worked in the foreign service for so many years, I felt we had a more global vision. We knew right from the beginning that it wasn't going to work to have an antagonistic relation for so many years. You see, we fought wars. We didn't get anything out of it. You know, So wars are never the solution. The only way, and we have examples around the world where you have regional cooperation. And we would say that, you know, let's get out of this. Let's look forward. Let's look 20, 30, 50 years ahead to our next generation and uh, try to resolve our issues so we can move forward. India, unfortunately, always took these gestures as a sign of weakness and became more belligerent. And I unfortunately feel that uh, this present government took it to a next level. Because when the former, in the former government, when Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif um, made so many gestures and the government uh, tried, I mean, they even attended the oath taking or whatever. Uh, India didn't respond. India, in fact, became even more antagonistic and it gave the Kashmiris an even tougher time. Absolutely, yeah. So, and these were writings, these were signals for us, which uh, I'm afraid, um, although the Foreign Office was steadfast in its advice, our advice has always been based on, 
on historical fact, on uh, ground realities, on what we see, what we hear. Um, unfortunately, you know, governments have not always heeded our advice. And I think policymakers at that time, uh, they didn't, they didn't see it that way. We said that, you know, this, you, because in, in the past we have uh, examples in the past when we have stretched, uh, reached out to India and not got anything in return. So let's, let's be a little more, you know, cautious. Let's be careful. Let's go step by step. So where does the solution lie? If we are to adopt the wolf warrior diplomacy that the Chinese have been adopting for quite some time, that would also give India a bit of a, you could say, you know, it's almost like an incentive for them to isolate Pakistan further. So if we are to go ahead and speak about negotiations to resolve disputes, that is taken as a sign of weakness. If we are to adopt a far more, you could say, nationalistic approach, that would also be viewed as uh, something which is uh, unacceptable to New Delhi. We, we say something in diplomacy, we learn something in diplomacy, sometimes it is best not to say or do anything. And I'm not saying literally don't do anything, but what I am saying is that you're right. Any more gestures, India will never accept. They're not in the mood to accept. This government, as I said, is only stating the obvious of what other previous governments of India have also been stating and feeling, but we just didn't read the signals, I think, at that time. But what I'm saying is that it's no good uh, reaching out to India at a time when it's not ready to, to even talk. At the same time, of course, we can't sit back. You know, it is a neighbor. We have to, I mean, it's a country just next door. Absolutely, just... yeah. geographical proximity. But I think what we, uh, this, uh, and, and we're not China, you know, China has a different dynamic, China is a different country, so we can't sort of adopt that. But I think for us right now, it's best to um, not try to engage with India. Uh, no need for us to reach out to India. Um, I'm not saying play hard to get, I mean, that, that sounds very, sort of, no, that's not the right, not play hard to get, but just no need to make any effort. There's no need. And you will see, and this is, this is my experience, you will see that in the end, it's India will have to come to the table. I mean, there's no, you see, there is no other option. Absolutely. At the moment, you see, the Modi government is facing a lot of internal issues. Uh, it's a huge country which is going through not only pandemics, but insurrections and all kinds of things happening inside India, economic implosions which you know are difficult for it. So Modi himself is in, in a state of, and there's no need for us to, to in, or try to talk or, or to engage with them. All right, Ambassador Riffa, let's come to the global environment with the incoming Biden administration set to resuscitate the JCPOA agreement with Iran and Pakistan's relationship with the United States. It's going to be determined by how this current government deals with the Biden administration. What do you think Pakistan's stance towards JCPOA or you could say rapprochement towards Iran should be uh, on part of Washington? Well, these are two, two different, uh, well, they're related, but two slightly different issues because JCPOA is one thing. You see, when the Americans pulled out of JCPOA, um, that really gave a, was a huge setback for the whole system because JCPOA was, um, it wasn't a bilateral agreement, it was a multilateral agreement. P5 plus one, yes. yes. And the UN was part of it and yeah. it was, it was considered to be something which was like above party politics, above governments. It was uh, when the Americans pulled out of it and pressured, although the Europeans didn't pull out, but the amount of pressure they were facing and then the, the UN was sort of ignored totally. An interesting thing happened in, in Iran. The Iranian society also, you know, is, is polarized because you have the hardline Iranians and then you have the moderates. And at, at present, the government is of the moderates, but the parliament in the last February elections, the parliament, the hardliners have come in and now 
when the presidential elections take place, there's every chance that there'll be a hardline president. But the parliament at that time, when JCPOA was happening, was a moderate of moderate uh, Muslims, and the supreme leader, the Ayatollah, of course, is the hardline. And the hardliner said, well, we told you so. We told you, don't go into this thing with the Americans. They're not to be trusted. Now look what's happened. Stricter sanctions have come on us. We're in a mess and this and that. So the Iranian society became even more polarized. And there was a huge disappointment within Iran, not only with the United States, but with the whole international system. That, you know, it's not just the US, it's the Europeans, it's the Japanese, it's the, Ch you know, the Chinese, the Russians, the, the UN, the whole system is like, how can, how can this be? How can they just be pandering to, to one particular country and one country with Iran will at least not in the near future ever have good relations with. Secondly, it, was a, it seemed to many Iranians as a signal that the United States was, and this was a fact also with, all, with, with the Trump administration, getting closer and closer to Saudi Arabia. So the Iranians were getting into this boxed in kind of feeling that, okay, we had one enemy, public enemy number one, the United States, and then we had enemy number two, which is Saudi Arabia. But now it seems that the other countries are also bandwagoning with the Trump administration. Exa exactly, and the fact that Israel was gaining importance and finding a space, a larger space for itself in the Middle East, in the Gulf, was also disturbing. So now the scenario is you have Gulf countries that have recognized Israel and for, the, and for the Iranians, and I think not only the Iranians, but for anybody, Israel equals America. Let's put it that way. They're sort of two sides of the same coin. America, Israel, Ekibate, right? So when they see that, well, uh, important Saudi allies and important Gulf countries are recognizing Israel, who knows when Saudi Arabia would recognize it? Maybe not very soon, but it's there. It's on the horizon somewhere. Well, Saudi Israel Arabia has made public statements uh, that they would not recognize Israel unless and until Palestinian statehood is guaranteed. Yes, that is a statement they have made. But if all the countries around decide to, if Saudi Arabia manages to convince all the countries in the region to recognize Saudi Arabia, then, you know, it's, it's sort of a... Works on the foregone conclusion then, yes. isn't it? That okay, if, if all the other countries are recognized in Saudi Arabia is not, it doesn't really. Now after JCPOA, after the pullout, after the reimposing of sanctions and even stricter sanctions, you know, because the, the second and third round of sanctions were actually targeting uh, Iranian financial institutions, you know, and they were sort of like cripple, crippling the economy totally. Even now, if in the corona pandemic, one of the reasons why Iran has suffered so badly is because, you know, medical supplies, although, although according to the sanctions, the, U, the UN has said, well, you know, you cannot, I remember the Swiss ambassador telling me this day that, well, you know, uh, first aid and medical supplies, these are not, these are, these are humane, uh, humanitarian issues and we cannot uh, put sanctions on them. But if companies are not going to sell their products to uh, Iran for fear that they have they may face some kind of repercussion. Backlash, yeah. yes. So that co companies like Pfizer and these big multinational uh, pharmaceuticals. Anyway, so now once uh, the JC they're out of the JCPOA, coming back is going to be very hard. Why is it going to be hard? First of all, we don't know what Biden has in mind, although he's made these public statements. But don't forget the United States is, is never one person, you know, it, it, they have an it's institution, the system, no? yeah. Yeah, they have a whole system, they have an institution. Um, there is, um, and uh, for Biden to, dis to come back to the JCPOA that was uh, signed during Obama's time, it may not be that easy. In any case, even for argument's sake, let's say, he does come back to them. We, they revive the old JCPOA, as the Iranians say. The Iranians say their bottom line is 
Let's go back to the original agreement. And it has to be implemented in letter and spirit. Nothing would be negotiated. Exactly. E but even if they were to do that now with Biden, Iranian public opinion is divided. Iranian sentiment has been hurt. And the growing influence of Israel in the region is not going to, is going to have an impact on this and they may not sign the JCPOA again that way. Because for Iran, you see, JCPOA, what was JCPOA? It was basically to allow Iran to have a breather and sell its oil and sort of revive itself a little bit. But a revival of Iran is a threat to Saudi Arabia threat to Israel, a threat to Israel, and of course, in a threat to the United States in that way. And the Iranians have figured it out. So um, I feel that JC, return to JCPOA is going to be very difficult for both administrations. For the Biden administration to bring it back to the original state of the Obama time, because, again, in the United States, you know, there's an anti-Iranian, very strong anti-Iranian. And the results of the U.S. election clearly demonstrates that it's a polarized environment. Exactly. You spoke about a polarized environment in Iran. It's also a polarized environment in, in the United, United States. States. So we shouldn't really so forget we don't, the yeah. margin. So I, don't, I, I think we're, putting, we're, we're sort of trying to put too much on Biden, that Biden may, it might be all goody-goody now and the JCPOA will be back. I don't know. I really don't. I, I, I have my doubts. But even if it was... I think the Iranians have now once bitten, twice shy. I mean, they lost a very important key general in a, in a last yeah. year. That really hurt Iranians. So the Iranians are now in this situation. They're saying, okay, these guys are coming in for our jugular. We're not going to let it happen. Now, how long will they be able to withstand that? Iran is uh, weak economically. Uh, that's why it's desperate to have uh, economic relations within the region. Uh, it's reached out to us many times. It continues to reach out, and we do. Iran has very good relations with China. They have signed this 25 years strategic uh, partnership. Iran has good relations with Russia. So Iran is now looking elsewhere, but this is going to take time, you know. Uh, for these economic uh, relations to develop and for the impact to be felt by the people. What we should do is what we, sh what we have always done and done very well is support the JCPOA in essence because it was a good agreement, it was a multilateral agreement. You see, we have to be multilateralists and we have to respect the multilateral system in the world. And we have to say that, you know, we, we can, you cannot have one country bullying another. But we, have to ha we also have to see how the Iranians respond to it. And I think the Iranian response this time is not going to be like it was before when uh, Zarif and uh, Kerry uh, signed the agreement. It, it's not going to be like that. It's going to be a very different. Because, you see, don't forget, um, as I said, there's been changes within Iran. Uh, hardliners are coming back. Uh, very soon when there's a presidential election, uh, I think it's going to be in 2021 next year. 2021, yes. And the presidential election will take place. There'll be a new president. Um, all the signals point towards uh, hardliners coming back. Zarif will go. All the moderates will go. And uh, JCPOA will be handled in a much different way by the Iranians. And of course, uh, we know what a hardline Iran, Iran has been in the past. It's going to be like. So Pakistan, of course, has to make sure that uh, we, we see what's happening within Iran. And we also see what's happening within the region. And we also have to ask ourselves this question, that this growing Israeli influence in the region, in the Gulf, is it of benefit to us in any way? Or is it something that we should be worried about? I mean, don't forget, now I'm coming to Gwadar and Jabahar. You see, uh, is it, would it be in Pakistan's interest 
to have Israel so close to Gavadar? I don't know. You know, by, what I'm implying is that if Israel has got ties with the United Arab Emirates, how far away is it from us? It's an unbelievable geographical proximity yeah. to yeah. Pakistan. Yeah. Okay. And um, already uh, we, we have to see that any prox close proximity with Israel may not be in our interest. Right. So, so we have to we have to handle. I mean, as the Chinese say, or as many people say, that these are in interesting times. The the Gulf, the Middle East, of course, South Asia, West Asia, Middle East. This region has always been an interesting region because it's always been a region in which things have been happening up and down. But I think now, with these latest developments, of course, things are coming to a head, and we have to see uh, which way we are going to. You know, it's uh, we don't have to take sides. We just have to take our own side. We just have to see what is good for us. Um, and if economic ties with uh, Iran and economic ties uh, with Afghanistan and econ stronger economic ties with Russia and China, they are in our interest, then why well, not? We should pursue them. Yeah, why, why do we have to just lean on one side all the time? Why do we have to look beyond the Atlantic? Why do we have to look just in the south towards our um, um, uh, Gulf uh, countries? I mean, of course, maintain your ties with them, but why not explore other avenues? Right. Master Rafa, before I go to the way forward, do you think that we've also witnessed that in 2020, the rise of populist governments all across the world, you've had uh, the Trump administration, mm -hmm. maybe Emmanuel Macron can actually fit that category as well. Mm -hmm. Do you think the likes of Jacinda Ardern of New Zealand or maybe the Angela Merkels of Germany have done a better job as compared to maybe their male right-wing counterparts? Of course, women in politics, uh, I think they play a very uh, important and vital role because they bring a different perspective. And they bring a more uh, varied perspective to, to any kind of a negotiation or any kind of political issue. Um, they will look at it from a, a different angle. And, and it's always good to have both angles in order to uh, reach a sort of an informed conclusion or decision. Um, but you know, uh, you have to see the countries where these women are from. I mean, Angela Great. Merkel is from Germany and Germany is uh, the powerhouse, economic powerhouse of the European Union and Europe, even before Angela Merkel was there. And of course, Angela Merkel has played a, a vital role, but they have an institution, you see? I mean, the, both these countries, were, and, and New Zealand, they have a democratic institution. We have to focus on building our de democratic institutions, which would then allow both men and women and the right man and the right woman to sort of come into power and take decisions. So it should not be, unfortunately, we should, we should move out of this individualistic and personal uh, sort of figures that we, I mean, we look at, we don't look at parties, we look at people. And I think we have to grow out of that. It's, it, Angela Merkel, of course, she she rose, but, but it's the Christian Democratic Party, you know, oh, yes. that's, that that's strong over there. The same with the um, um, Prime Minister. Same with any uh, Prime Minister or, or ruler in in any Western democracy or any democratic. Uh, country. But do you think they've been more committed towards multilateralism as compared to maybe the populist leaders who have pursued a unilateral? You know, uh, I, I yes, yes. In that, for example, I can give you the example of the ambassador of, of the the Prime Minister of Norway. Uh, she is uh, the Hoyre Party is a right wing party. Right. It's right. a conservative party. Yes. Uh, but uh, she is also more multilateral. And I think that is the reason for that is because I, uh, it's, uh, I don't know if I should say it's a gender thing, but I think women do try to uh, resolve a problem by looking at all angles. And that in a way brings in multilateralism. So, you know, you consult 
a whole group of people before reaching a conclusion, whereas our male colleagues may have uh, the confidence or overconfidence or machoism yeah. to decide for themselves that what I say is right. Very rarely would you find a woman saying that, no, listen to me, I'm right. Even if she says that, she would have consulted at least 10 people before saying that. Well, we that. did have the Margaret Thatchers as well. I mean. That's why I'm saying, that's why in the beginning I told you what is important is to develop the institutions, the parties, the political base. Individuals then don't matter so much. But in that, being a woman myself, I think women do do a better job than men. Right. That's Fine. my opinion. Absolutely. And our final question, Ambassador Rafat. Going into 2021, what should Pakistan's foreign policy priorities be? Pakistan's foreign policy priorities should be what they've always been, Pakistan first. What is good for us? Um, I think so far we have been doing a reasonably good job because we have been maintaining a very good balance, as I said right at the beginning. Um, we must continue to engage with our neighbors less so with India at the moment because India is not in a state to be engaged with but once uh, things change in India of course engage with India we've been doing it all along um, but neighborhood first I think that uh, having served in two neighboring countries I, I am of the firm opinion that we have to have a stable secure neighborhood that has to be our first priority well, no, second. First priority is stable, secure Pakistan, yes. internally. Pakistan first. Pakistan. Right. Internally, we have to be stable and secure, economically secure, politically, and uh, then a secure neighborhood, and then the larger neighborhood and so forth. And make decisions, or at least try to make decisions as independently as we can, um, and not fall into any camp or tow any line just for our own survival. Thank you so much Ambassador Rifat Masood for being with me on Policy Beats. Thank you very much. Camera. All right. So that's all that we have uh, from this episode of Policy Beats. You can follow us on social media by logging on to Twitter, Facebook and also do follow us on YouTube as well. That's all from me Hamza Rifat. Well, till the next time, take care and Allah Hafiz.